Good afternoon, or good morning for those west of this time zone, and welcome to our webinar, Getting the Gas Sector's Energy Transition Underway. I'm Justin Goodlock. I'm a senior attorney at the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU Law School, and I extend that welcome on behalf of Policy Integrity and also our co-sponsors for this event, the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School and the State Energy and Environment Impact Center at NYU Law School. I and my colleague, Jennifer Dennis, a senior fellow at the Sabin Center, are going to kick things off Nina Farah, our moderator today, will then take over and you will hear from her and our speakers. After their presentations and some moderated discussion, we will take questions from the audience. Today in the US, a large and growing number of residential and commercial buildings are connected to a gas distribution network and rely on fossil gas for heating, water heating, and cooking applications. Part of the energy transition will have to involve halting that growth and eventually reversing it. By way of introduction, I want to point out three things about this piece of the energy transition. Its importance, some of its particular challenges, and the urgency of getting it underway. So item one, importance. Residential and commercial buildings rank below the transportation and power sectors in terms of their contributions to annual greenhouse gas emissions in the US, but their direct contribution is substantial, between 12 and 13% of the total. In addition to being a major source of emissions, uh, the nature and cost of energy use in buildings is especially consequential for those buildings' tenants. Item two, challenges. The networks of pipes and control systems that deliver gas to buildings are sprawling and expensive. They embody investments made in the expectation that ratepayers would use them for many decades. Also, the millions of buildings they serve tend to last for 30 years or more. In cities like New York, that number is closer to 90 years. Transition, therefore, means potentially cutting short, wholly or partly, the useful life of investments made in gas systems and in building stock. For some, and possibly many, this will be unwelcome and disruptive. In addition, transition will mean coordinating many investments, large and small, on the part of numerous actors, some of whom are unlikely to want to just go along. Item three is urgency. If our current rate of greenhouse gas emissions didn't put us on pace to destabilize the climate in the next 30 years, we might be able to just stop building things that rely on fossil gas and shutter branches of the gas system incrementally as demand dwindles. But we're out of time, so extensive retrofitting is unavoidable. Also, the investments we're talking about create path dependencies, deep ruts that are hard to climb out of. This is true of investments that continue end users' reliance on gas, and it will be true if aggressive efforts are made to replace fossil gas with alternatives. Investing one way or the other will make it harder to switch. Now, these sorts of investments are made constantly, so we can't avoid a rut, we just have to choose which one we'd rather be in. In addition to those three fundamental features of the situation, there's one more that I think deserves mention. At this point, stakeholders currently engaged in the discussion of where we're going and how to get there seem more often than not to talk past each other. Gas utilities regulatory filings often exude confidence that in 2040 and beyond, they will probably play basically the same role as they do today, and on the other side, advocates for electrification often seem to envision shockingly fast rates of coordinated departure from gas systems and the adoption of cleaner alternative technologies. So having said all of that, I hope I've given you some reasons to feel that attending this event is a worthwhile use of your time. I'm now gonna turn the mic to Jen and uh, she will talk a bit about why we're focusing this discussion on the states. Thanks, Justin. And thanks to our panelists and guests for joining this conversation. I'm Jennifer Danis, and as Justin mentioned, I'm a senior fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. I wanted to discuss briefly the legal context behind why gas transition planning at the state level is so critically important. I came into this space after spending the last five years focusing much of my practice on litigation challenging FERC decisions on interstate gas pipelines. Together with other advocates working on interstate gas pipeline issues, we've succeeded in getting some courts to begin viewing the Commission's gas infrastructure decisions with some skepticism. And for good reason. The Commission approves 100% of projects where there are LDCs or marketers holding contracts for capacity. That's been FERC's one-dimensional way to assess public need. But we've also succeeded in getting the Commission to review its decades-old paradigm for authorizing gas infrastructure. That process is underway. 
As many of you are likely aware, just yesterday, comments were due in FERC's docket in which it requested recommendations for how to change its paradigm. Our comments, like many stakeholders, reflected the reality that first, FERC is not a gas planning commission. And second, most of the data the commission needs to make the right decisions on interstate gas infrastructure lives at the state level. Yet, by the time LDC shippers holding firm capacity on these pipelines come to the states for cost recovery, it's too late for the states to protect their citizens from the project's worst impacts, both environmental and economic. Reflecting this disconnect between state regulatory authority and federal authority, many states weighed into this federal policy docket saying just that. From state ratepayer advocates to attorneys general, PUCs, departments of environmental protection, they all noted the significant work that states are doing to transition away from gas and planning to meet greenhouse gas reduction goals and asked the Federal Commission to dig a little deeper when determining that any new gas infrastructure serves the public interest. As Justin said, gas transition planning at the state level, along with geographically granular studies of current and future gas demand, capacity and climate goals is critically important and most definitely urgent. States are the ones positioned to lead this charge and right-sizing federal gas authorization depends on them to do so. But states are also the ones who will have to grapple with the thorny issues accompanying how to transition quickly and importantly, equitably. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nina to help us start the conversation about tackling these thorny issues. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Leslie Cohen. Le um, Assemblywoman Cohen is in her fourth term um, as um, the, in the Nevada State Assembly and is uh, the current chair of the Assembly Revenue Committee and vice chair of the Natural Resources Committee. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so earlier this year, Nevada's Governor Steve Sisolak rolled out the state climate strategy um, and this laid the groundwork for bold actions necessary to improve Nevada's resilience to current and future impacts of climate change. And um, so we've seen proposals that include closing emissions inspection loopholes for classic car license plates, which I'm glad to say passed off uh, the assembly floor last night, uh, adopting appliance and equipment efficiency standards and transitioning away from residential and commercial use of fossil fuels like natural gas, expanding conserved lands and waters, um, and we passed uh, 30 by 30, um, transitioning from fossil fueled electricity generation to clean energy sources and requiring greenhouse gas reduction plans and uh, to prioritize decarbonization and utility integrated resource plans. Uh, it also provided a framework for reducing Nevada's greenhouse gas emissions across all economic sectors, consistent with the greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets set by the Nevada legislature in 2019 and commensurate with Nevada's commitments as a member of the United States Climate Alliance. Uh, we also released this year, or also released this year, was the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection's Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report. And unfortunately, Nevada is not anticipated to hit our emission reduction targets. The report showed that without bold action, the state will fall 4% short of the 2025 goal and 19% short of the 2030 emission reductions goals. By meeting the state's emission reduction targets, Nevada would prevent between uh, um, 172 and, uh, and 786 million in economic damages by 2030 and up to 4 billion by 2050. The report highlighted the prevalence and evidence of natural gas and petroleum as two of the largest sources of energy related emissions. It also outlined opportunities to expand the use of zero and near zero emission renewable energy sources in Nevada through increasing electrification. By replacing activities that currently depend on fossil fuels with electric equivalences like electric cars and heating uh, as some examples, 
and then further increasing our dependence on renewable energy sources to generate electricity. Nevada can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonize. Uh, proposals to address greenhouse gas emissions include renewable portfolio standards, which we passed in 2019, electric utility vehicle infrastructure planning, phasing out fossil fuel fired electricity generating sources, and of course, initiating integrated resource plan processes for energy utilities. President Biden's climate team says uh, it underestimated President Trump's damage to the environment. Um, there were deeper budget cuts, wider staff losses, and more systematic elimination of climate programs and research than they had realized. However, Biden's climate plans remain um, intact. This includes the goal of decarbonizing the electricity sector by 2035 and reaching net zero U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. But all that being said, states like Nevada still need to lead the way on climate change action and our work is, is not nearly done. Based on the state climate strategy, legislation was introduced to help support both the federal and state climate goals, including my own proposal, which was a gas utility IRP. My legislation would have established an integrated resource plan process for gas companies in Nevada to undergo with our public utilities commission. Uh, this would have provide long-term planning and transparency on new gas infrastructure and replacement, evaluate new investments against lower carbon options like electrification, and to make future investments align with state carbon reduction goals. Um, and I should also note that currently our electric utility already undergoes an IRP and has done so since the late 80s. Other legislation that fit into the proposed policy areas outlined by the state climate strategy were also int introduced, uh, like I already mentioned, closing the smog uh, check program loopholes. Uh, we had a lot of 1990s Camrys and um, Honda Accords that were, had classic car license plates and were getting around uh, smog check requirements because of that. Um, so that was, so what we're, with that now we can modify the state emissions fees and fund smog repair programs and low income um, incentives in, in two of Nevada's largest counties. Uh, also adopting appliance and equipment efficiency standards and supporting the nationwide push to conserve 30% of our lands and waters by the year 2030. As I mentioned, that also passed um, out of the assembly and I'm I'm sorry, we're on day 116 of our uh, biennial 120 day session. So I, I don't remember if, if that's passed the Senate yet, but I think it has. Um, so these are just to name a few of our great pieces of legislation that we in introduced during this legislative session. In the past, Nevada has made great strides to propel the use of renewable energy and to initiate climate protections. Uh, but this legislative session, the pandemic presented unprecedented challenges to our legislative process. Um, we, in a special session last year, or I'm sorry, earlier this year, no, last year, see, I'm losing years. Uh, last year, we, we had to cut a fourth of our state's annual budget, uh, $1.2 billion. So um, it just made it difficult to make, to have robust, discussions on environmental issues. And unfortunately, my gas IRP bill was one of the casualties um, under these difficult circumstances. Uh, what we saw from gas, the gas utility was a full court press attempt to push back against my gas IRP legislation and broader policy efforts by the governor's administration aimed at transitioning away from natural gas. The gas utility and their allies, um, such as AARP and our Latin Chamber of Commerce, spoke out against my proposal, citing the outsized impact it could have on jobs, low income rate payers and seniors on fixed incomes. Uh, the utilities and their allies also made public show of charity to minority legislative caucuses during the COVID-19 pandemic and orchestrated a well-coordinated media campaign uh, defining my bill, AB 380, as banning natural gas appliances in homes and businesses. Uh, there were literally op-eds saying things like, Grandma or Abuelito is going to lose her stove by 2023 uh, because of my legislation. Uh, so the tone and tenor of the discussion on my bill became more noticeable as the session went on, 
even while uh, myself and the advocates for the bill actively worked with the utility to try to address their concerns um, with any of the concepts in the bill. We work with stakeholders, the gas utility and labor groups for many weeks and substantially amended the bill, taking their concerns um, in mind, things that didn't necessarily, we didn't think it said what or would do what they said it would do um, or say what they said it said, but we still took that out, made modifications, and we still could not get them to the table, um, even in neutral, they were just opposed. And, and we've seen a similar battle play out in state houses across the country. We've seen local governments pledging to curb greenhouse gas emissions and utilities have lobbied state lawmakers to preempt those efforts. Uh, last year, Arizona's Governor Doug Ducey signed legislation backed by that, their gas utility to pro prohibit local governments from banning gas in new buildings. And Nevada's main gas utility provider is also the same gas utility that services Arizona. Um, I was talking to a legislator from Arizona about a totally unrelated subject, and um, she had no idea that I was I was the um, that AB 380 was my bill. And she said to me, she works with the utility a lot on charity things. And did I hear about this gas utility bill in Nevada? And what was up with that? Um, so while the fight's far from over, I think my bill in this legislative session provided an important first step. And all sites know the issue isn't going away. Um, from historic droughts, unprecedented heat waves, and uh, being home to two of the fastest warming cities in the nation. Nevada families are already feeling the effects of climate change, and we know we must continue to act and get some resolution on this. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Cohen. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from David Danner. And David Danner is the chair of the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission since 2013, and he's previously served as the agency's executive director, as policy advisor to Governor Gary Locke, and as member of the state's Pollution Controls Hearing Board. Go right ahead. Great. Thank you, Nina. I appreciate it. So I'm going to basically give the perspective of a regulator. Uh, I'm from Washington State, as you said, and of course, we're feeling the, the effects of climate change at an unprecedented scale. It's affecting our shellfish industry, our timber industry. We rely on hydropower for about 75% of our electric load, and our snowpack this year is once again below what we used to call normal. Um, and um, we are seeing a dramatic rise in the number and the intensity of wildfires. And in the past 30 years, we've seen about a tenfold increase in our state firefighting budget. And uh, our April this year was the seventh hottest in history following a March that was the 11th hottest in history. So we have challenges. Um, many of you know that my governor, Governor Jay Inslee has put a lot of political capital into addressing carbon pollution. Um, in 2019, he signed a law requiring our state's electric utilities to get off coal power by the end of 2025 to be net carbon neutral by 2030 and to be 100% carbon free by 2045. And then in 2020, he signed legislation establishing binding targets for carbon uh, emissions reductions. So that by 2022, we're gonna reduce the overall emissions of greenhouse gases in the states to 1990 levels, which is uh, about 95.5 million metric tons. And then it steps up uh, gradually to 2050 when we will have reduced overall emissions and greenhouse gases to, to 5 million tons or 95% below 1990 levels. Um, and this year he also signed legislation establishing a cap and trade program in Washington, a zero emissions vehicle standard and a low carbon fuel standard. Um, he has been promoting electric vehicles and my agency has worked with utilities in developing transportation electrification plans to ensure that we have car charging infrastructure where it needs to be. So what about natural gas? Um, in Seattle, our largest city, and in many cities in California and elsewhere, of course, we're seeing these ordinances that ban the use of gas in new construction, in some cases existing homes. Um, and uh, this year, Governor Inslee signed legislation that directs my utilities commission to initiate a study uh, looking at how we can reduce emissions in the natural gas sector consistent with those carbon reduction targets that I just mentioned. This is a study that we must complete by mid-2023, and so we're just beginning our, our planning on the study. 
So I don't want to prejudge uh, what the study will say, so I can't tell you what the study can say, but I can share with you my thinking at this point and thinking about the questions that we need to ask. I mean, we start off, of course, what makes it so challenging is you're trying to decarbonize something that is a fossil fuel. And for the most part, it's sold for the sole purpose of being burned. Um, in Washington state, direct fuel, uh, direct use of natural gas counts for about 10% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So how do you decarbonize a carbon-based industry? Um, I think it, a lot of the things that I'm gonna say have been uh, touched on or discussed by the other panelists, but I'm gonna go over them again. First, I, th I do think states need to review the policies that promote the, the use of natural gas or which effectively give an advantage to natural gas over other fuels. Um, some states, including my own, had enshrined in state law policies that all citizens are entitled to affordable natural gas. And those laws go back to a time before carbon pollution was a salient issue or when natural gas was viewed as a bridge fuel. Um, we, we repealed that just a few weeks ago, and our state policy is now that everyone's entitled to affordable energy. Um, but California, for example, still has such a law on the books, and it's been uh, cited by utilities looking to beat back local ordinances uh, that have been banning uh, gas in new construction. Um, I also think utility commissions need to review their line extension policies. Basically, our current law in, or policy in Washington is a, is a methodology that it's called the perpetual net and present value methodology and essentially imposes costs on existing gas customers to subsidize gas connections to new customers uh, in, in many situations. And I've called upon the commission to change that methodology so that developers pay the full cost of gas connections. Um, and, and I think that that's basically, you know, let's see how natural gas fares in the market. And that gives alternatives like electric appliances and heat pumps a shot in the marketplace. Um, so that is still a discussion that's ongoing at my commission. Um, second, we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to reduce emissions in the existing gas uh, system. That means we have to be better at plugging leaks in the gas system. In Washington, we have every utility on a pipeline replacement plan to get rid of the cast iron and bare steel pipe, as well as some, some certain uh, uh, plastic pipe from the 1970s that's proven itself to be defective. Um, we've now removed all the cast iron and bare steel from the system and we're making headway on plastic pipes. And I know that many states, as, including Massachusetts, as we heard, um, have a long way to go on this front. Um, there is the problem here, if you're trying to reduce investment in fossil fuel infrastructure, what do you do when you have uh, infrastructure that is still being used and is still useful, um, but has safety problems and needs new investment? And so far, we are not going to um, interrupt these pipeline replacement plans um, because safety is too important for us to, to um, uh, really slow down on. Um, but that is a conundrum that we have to face going forward. Um, we also have to stop leaks from third party damage. Every year my agency posts the methane emissions that come from leaks and in 2020, our utilities identified some 4,000 leaks that emitted about 30,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalents. And by far the largest part of that was third party excavator damage. Um, and uh, so states need to strengthen the 811 call before you dig programs. They need to really enforce the requirements that utilities make timely locates and that citizens call before they dig and we get serious about penalties against contractors who dig without getting locates first. And I'm really pleased that the new uh, uh, leadership at the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration or FINSA is really looking seriously at ways to reduce methane emissions from gas pipelines um, with things like advanced leak detection and other initiatives. So, you know, those are things that we can do now. But the larger issue of reaching carbon reductions has to rest more on just than just slowing down the growth of the gas system or replacing older defective pipes. To get reductions, you really have to transition the gas system in significant ways. And, and what does that mean? Well, you know, the, the options that we've heard, one option is to simply electrify everything. But if you're going to impose an outright ban on natural gas by a date certain, you need to consider all these complications. How do you deal with stranded costs? We have billions of dollars of infrastructure and hundreds of jobs. If we abandon the gas system, how do we set the depreciation rates on the system? Do we allow offsets? Is there a way to repurpose that infrastructure and, and save those jobs? And of course, we've been hearing a lot about hydrogen and renewable natural gas and carbon capture and storage. Um, and uh, some of the utilities I regulate have started programs to uh, 
uh, incorporate hydrogen into their system. Um, and all of our utilities are currently uh, by state law required to offer uh, renewable natural gas at a premium to any customer who wants it. Can any of those technologies be successful in making reductions in carbon emissions? Um, the jury's still out. Um, basically, you know, we have these options, There's business as usual, which we know we can't do, electrification, um, which has real problems, and, um, and then uh, technologies that may or may not uh, uh, prove themselves in the long run. But even electrification, um, there, there are real uh, complications. And I mentioned, um, you know, are there ways to repurpose? But if we're going to electrify, we have to be sure that we have sufficient generation to serve this new load. And that means new power plants. In our case, that'll be renewable energy because that's what's required by law. Um, but you also have to have transmission and distribution infrastructure to get the power to the load. And in the Pacific Northwest, we're already seeing resource adequacy challenges as fossil generation is taken offline, the hydropower system is stressed and wildfires disrupt the power with increasing regularity. And then next, we have to make sure that any transition doesn't harm the most vulnerable people on the system. Um, and I think uh, we heard from, in, from Massachusetts, just, you know, th this is what happens when you have this transition, you're going to have a smaller and smaller customer base paying for the system, and that's going to lead to higher costs for those who stay on. And it's going to be the most vulnerable who can't afford new appliances or um, uh, are going to be stuck on the system in the end. And I've seen some numbers uh, two to five times as much, and, and uh, so we'll be looking at that. Um, and then there's the political element too, the political challenges. People like cooking with gas, they don't wanna lose it. There'll be those people who will oppose this. The gas utilities themselves are not keen on writing their own obituaries and they have political clout as evidenced by the many states that have passed the uh, laws prohibiting uh, local governments from imposing gas bans of one kind or another. The pipe fitters unions and workers advocates will oppose any measures that affect their livelihoods unless they see a future in it for themselves and their families. Um, so all of these are complications that we're going to be looking at. We have this study that uh, has to be done by uh, the middle of 2023, uh, and we're going to be getting on it. There's a lot of complications, but I need to stress, stress how important it is that we thread this needle because the impacts of climate change are so significant and so imminent, and the cost of doing nothing are going to be far greater than... Um, and, it, it, and so we, we really do have to do something. Um, but it's hard and we can do hard things. Let's see how it goes. So thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Nina. Thank you so much. Um, I suppose a question that I have for everyone on the panel is, um, does it seem like the best approach for states to incentivize um, moving away from new gas hookups or looking for ways to incentivize renewables? what do you think would be sort of the best policy approach for, for states here? And can we start with um, John, please? So um, uh, let, me, uh, let me take a bit of a New York centric view, uh, but I do think it extrapolates to the world, uh, to the nation. I think um, we can decarbonize the power sector. Um, uh, the, the clean technologies are making really uh, impressive strides. Um, they're getting cheaper. They're uh, developing uh, in their capacity. It's true for solar, it's true for wind, it's true for offshore wind, um, it's true for hydro. Um, we're going to need um, some grid build out. We're going to need um, flexibility on the grid, both in terms of storage as well as, um, as dynamic responsive load. But I know there's millions of man years of engineering left in front of us on renewable, on decarbonizing the grid, but I think we know how to do that. Um, the work is really on making progress in buildings. And I think that that's where the novel policy has to turn its attention. Chair Danner, how about you? What do you think? Well, I think, you know, our incentives, of course, will be part of it. Um, you know, we are just getting into uh, developing performance-based rate making in our state, which is basically a, a looking at what kind of incentives do you want to have so that there is a reward or a penalty to a utility for certain kinds of behaviors. And we'll see how this 
factors into it. But there are other things that are really more command and control. If you have uh, building codes that drive things in the right direction, that might be a better way to, to approach things. Um, if you have uh, uh, car enforceable carbon reductions goals, um, uh, that too uh, really guides how you, you do things. So I think it's gonna be a mix of, of incentives and uh, legal requirements. Um, and that's probably the best way to go. I think the, the companies need certainty, um, but they also need to develop their, their own culture for decarbonization. And uh, Ms. Tepper, how about for you? What do you think? Sorry, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you know, I, I think we're in such a big fight that we are gonna have to do sort of an all-in approach. Um, but I agree with um, Chair Rhodes that we know how to do the electricity um, sector and we've been doing it for a while and we know what to do there and, and renewables are becoming increasingly competitive. Um, you know, they're not going to need uh, incentives anymore, um, particularly with offshore wind coming on um, at a remarkably low level. And on the gas side, we're, frankly, I think people are just starting to think about the gas side. Um, our state just passed a stretch code, which I think will make a big difference, um, but it's gonna take a while for that to get implemented and for people to pass it. And um, so I think it's gonna take a combination of things like the stretch code, but also um, particularly subsidies um, for low-income customers. Can, I'm sorry, can you define what a stretch code is for those of us who oh, might not sure. be familiar? Sure. In, in our case, I think they can have varying meanings, but in our case, a stretch code is an, a voluntary code that towns can adopt that will be more stringent um, with respect to the kind of um, fossil fuel technology that can be used in buildings. And Assemblywoman Cohen, I would love for you to weigh in as well about um, what you think, especially if you're going to try to reintroduce uh, your legislation and um, what you might do differently uh, next time around. I think for me, um, what I, you know, we, we faced a real uphill battle um, and I don't think I realized at the beginning how much the utility company was going to um, fight and kind of weaponize communities of color, um, low income communities. So I think um, what would be important is for me and what we're going to work on in the interim is, is, is getting, our information out and um, making sure that there there is information out that is that is truthful that that you know again I think I, I mentioned the Abelita is going to lose her stove in 2023 and um, you know while we tried really hard to make sure people understood look there are changes coming whether we make them as a state or as a state government or not the market's going to dictate these changes and what happens to your grandmother or you, because right, we're talking for us, we're talking, you know, years in the future, what happens if um, the changes are made around you, um, but not in your home. And then all of a sudden you don't have access to this utility and you're left with um, not having planned that transition. So I think making sure people, so the bottom line for me would be, it's making sure that people understand. For us, we weren't talking about changes coming next year or necessarily in the next 10 years, but over the next 30 years. And then just making sure they understand that no one's being forced to change anything, but that we're planning for what happens when those changes come. So it seems like this conversation about equity really comes down to who is going to pay for this transition. So can we talk a little bit about what, where is the money for this transition coming from? What are the ideas out there for making this an equitable change? Um, Assemblywoman Cohen, if you'd like to start. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that was part of what we wanted. Part of what our, our bill did was was um, have the PUC looking into all of this um, and making making those plans. And, and again, we're talking, you know, for us, we're talking about possibly making plans for 30 years out. Um, but 
making sure that we're addressing them. Also, I think when we talk about money, we have to realize that when the a gas utility builds out to a new area, um, which we've had happen where they built out to uh, you know a new town or a town that was just transitioning to gas, right? The improvement for that town was literally transitioning to gas. Um, we, we're paying for it anyway. The ratepayers are always going to pay for that. So it's something that, that it, all around we need to address those financial issues. Um, and, and it wasn't necessarily something that we had the answers for just yet, but we were saying we need to be um, looking at this now as opposed to in the future when we're right up against it. Ms. Tepper, as a ratepayer advocate, can you talk a little bit about, or as the Attorney General's office, being a ratepayer advocate, can you talk about um, some ideas for, for making this make sense financially for customers? Sorry, you're muted. I'm trying so hard not to have my noise from my house coming in uh, through it. Um, I think as, you know, Assemblywoman Cohen talked about, um, I, we're, business as usual um, is going to cost more. So I think we have to stop with start with that premise. And I think we have a big educational um, job on our hands. And I think we need to include that in any plan that we come up with is going to have to be trying to um, get people on board with this transition because we're not going to be able to do it um, unless people understand the benefits of it to them. Um, and as the ratepayer advocate, we're part of the reason why we want to have this plan, um, an overall arching plan, is to figure out where that money is going to come from and how, what is the most cost effective way to do this so that the most vulnerable don't pay and that we keep the price as low as possible. So I don't think people know the answer yet to that question. And then how about from the utility perspective? What seems to make the most sense in, in making this um, not be so painful financially? Um, Chair Danner, if you'd like to start. Well, thanks. Well, I don't want to speak for the utilities. I, I, I will tell you that, you know, we, we look at where the money comes from. You basically, you know, you only have a few choices. It's going to come from shareholders. It's going to come from taxpayers. Um, or it's going to come from, from rate payers. Um, my job as a regulator is to make sure that those costs are as low as possible to, uh, to uh, balance them among the, the rate payers and the shareholders. Um, uh, there's also, as we go forward, it, it may be that we need to look at something novel. And I, certainly I don't want to say that I've, I've landed on this, but it's something I want to talk about with my stakeholders is um, there are going to be winners and losers. If you're an electric utility, you're going to gain customers and maybe you're going to have more load. If you're a gas utility, you're going to lose some. So maybe we need to talk about what kind of a transfer uh, there needs to be. Um, and uh, maybe for dual fuel utilities, that's not quite as big an issue. But when you have uh, one, you know, you have a gas company that's only a gas company, um, you know, you really need to, to um, figure out how to get them involved because um, they're not really um, uh, that enthusiastic to write their own obituary. So, um, but, but I, I think that the real, as Rebecca said, the first thing you do is how do you assess these costs and how do you keep them as low as possible so that uh, you're, as you go forward, um, you, can, you can assess what they are and then you can work from that kind of, have full information as you go forward. John, we have just about a minute left until we begin the okay. audience Q&A. Uh, what do you think about how to pay for this? So um, I think, first of all, I agree um, that the status quo is not free. So I just think we need to kind of think about uh, future costs as not the new stuff is more expensive. Uh, is this as usual in the future is expensive. But then I think there's a three-legged stool. Um, in terms of policy. One is uh, minimize the costs. Technology can do a lot to minimize costs. Heat pumps are getting better, um, you know, and the list goes on. Um, we've seen it in, in solar and vehicles and the like. And we can also um, be more stringent on the costs that we allow 
um, and that goes to the heart of my minimize um, uh, go forward investment mantra, but minimize cost too. The second leg is we have to protect the low income customers. And we have to protect the low income customers who transition with us, who say electrify and make sure that their future ongoing costs are lower than today. And we have to make sure to protect uh, the customers who low income customers, especially who do not transition um, so that they, they don't get burdened just because they didn't have whatever the savvy or the access or the uh, privileged avenues to participate. And I'll just make a shout out to something in uh, New York called the Energy Affordability Program, which caps utility bills as a percentage of income. Um, and that sort of relates a little bit to the third leg of the stool, which is, um, I think, going to uh, David's um, three places we can go get money, uh, shareholders, taxpayers, and customers. Um, I think getting money from, from customers is regressive in my mind. Um, that's so uh, I think raising money by utility rates is a way of, of taxing um, the most burdened, the most vulnerable unduly. Um, so if we're gonna use public dollars, I think there's a very good case uh, for them to be tax dollars because those, that, those, those are more progressive regimes. Um, and then the other point I, I really endorse is that there are companies who have profited um, from this uh, regime. Uh, they can be asked to share some of the financial burden. And as David pointed out, there are companies, including electric utilities, who will profit um, from, from the transition that we're talking about, and they too can be asked to share the burden. Those are my three legs of the stool. Now we're gonna jump into some of the questions from the audience. Um, we have one question here that asks, any advice for those of us in states that pass preemption bills? How should we move forward in advocating for a swift transition to clean energy? And whoever would like to tackle that one, feel free to jump in. You know, I'll, I'll step in. I mean, I, the, the politics in every state are going to be difficult. And obviously, in some states, it's going to be far more difficult than in others. I think that um, going forward, um, some of these states, I, I think, uh, I don't know that you're going to be able to get them to, to change those laws. But I also think that um, uh, it's just like anything else. We saw it with renewable portfolio standards and others, uh, other things that Basically, when a few states uh, start out and prove the concept, other states will come along. So hopefully, um, uh, some of the states that are really looking at this issue or have not um, barred uh, local governments um, will start to see some results, and we we can we can learn from that, and hopefully that will change some minds going forward. Yep. Go ahead, John. So um, I I also look. I think that. David's right, the uh, political uh, situation in every state is going to be difficult. Um, it, it's, it's, it's difficult in New York, uh, which is a progressive state on this issue, and they're gonna be different. But I do think that there are some coalition building arguments that probably are not getting enough um, play. One is that um, you can, with electrification in most of the country, even today, and the story gets better as we fast forward to the future, you can save monthly costs. So there's kind of a fundamental pocketbook appeal that's possible. Um, it's not possible if you talk about how painful electrification is going to be and how intimidating and disruptive um, to the homeowner but it is possible if you actually make it easy and straightforward and, um, and, and line up the economics so that it's something that uh, the household can say yes to. Um, and the second thing is that we know that the kind of work that's associated with electrification is a massive job engine. And we are talking about trades, um, we are talking about depending on the time scale, millions of jobs. 
um, that are that are possible and that, that can be that can be good paying jobs. Um, they're future jobs. Um, they're not um, so it's hard to sort of um, really assemble uh, an organized set of um, folks around it. But I do think that both the jobs angle and the pocketbook angle um, for a family um, is um, is something that's that's much. These these are arguments or directions that are much more possible than uh, I think they are being practiced today. Nina, could I chime in with one other point? Sure. So this might not be a satisfying answer to the question, but in addition to what we've already heard, I would add that as more people have direct experience of alternatives, I think that will matter a lot. And as they're written about, it will matter a lot. A number of articles that I have read, including one recently from Colorado, uh, discussed electrification as though it was almost uh, an act of self-sacrifice and painful. And there was one quote in the article from uh, someone who installed heat pumps who said, yeah, the problem I find is people are skeptical about getting something for nothing. It's so great, but they don't believe it. I feel like there's, there's a potential sea change just waiting as folks learn from their neighbors about uh, this kind of alternative. And I, don't, I realize that is well short of the regulatory and the legal, but I think it is going to be a factor especially in states where you've seen some thwarting at the outset uh, in legal terms. That leads in really well to the next question, which um, is how many states currently are undergoing planning to try to address um, gas transitions? Do we have a head count of how many are working on this right now? Maybe five. I don't know. I mean, we know we know that California, New York, um, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, right? Um, Commissioner Danner has his legislation. Um, I don't. I don't know who else. Yeah, someone has just oh, look, uh, the crowd five in the chat. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Right. At Colorado, yes, that's right, Colorado. Mm -hmm. New Jersey is starting the process as well. And I'm seeing a couple of questions here about um, alternatives. And uh, that reminded me of a question I had actually about um, what to do, uh, whether using like renewable natural gas is a good option potentially for uh, dealing with some stranded assets here. Is that something that's on the table or, or not? Uh, <laughs> go ahead. The, uh, let's see. Can we go with um, Chair Danner first? So, yeah, it's, you know, it, it is on the table. It is something that our utilities are looking at. Our legislature has already required us to have a, a voluntary renewable natural gas program. The question that we're going to be asking as we do our study forward is really what kind of supply of renewable natural gas is out there? Um, is it is it big enough that it can really make a dent? And the second question, what are the emissions that come from renewable natural gas? Um, so, you know, I don't want to say, no, it's not possible. I want to take a hard look at it. Um, but those, those are the questions we have to ask. And, and right now, from the things I've read, which is not a complete literature re review by any means, um, I think that the uh, supply is limited and the uh, carbon emissions potential is not as great as we need to meet our state goals. Uh, Ms. Tepper, did you yeah. want to answer that? Yeah, I would agree. And you know, I would also add that my concern about the way that renewable natural gas and hydrogen are being discussed, um, particularly um, among the utility industry, is it's being used as a way to try to kick the can down the road and say, we don't need to do anything now because we're going to do all this research on these new technologies um, and then we'll put them in later. Um, and so we can, we can continue to build pipe. We can continue business as usual because we're gonna use these technologies in the future. And I think that is a very damaging uh, message and I think it's wrong. And I think we all need to be aware of it. And when it, when it comes out, because it's coming out in newspapers, it's, when it comes out, I think people need to speak out against that because it's not true. 
So is renewable natural gas like- Renewable natural the, gas will very likely play a role. Will it be and, like the clean coal discussion though? Is it that sort of situation or, or more useful? I, think, I don't think we know how much um, it ultimately will use of renewable natural gas. I think it, maybe um, Commissioner or Chair Rose has more to say on that. Go ahead, John. Look, well, I, I think we're a little bit constrained by the fact that this, the state of the art right now is not that great. Um, so that, you know, with any luck and if technology advancement can really work, we might have answers that are better in 10 or 20 years than we do today. Um, but uh, my understanding um, is very much along the lines of, uh, of, of Chair Danner's, um, that the supply is limited and my further understanding is that um, of the supply that you can see, um, the majority is bad to get, as in emissions ratios that you do not like, and a minority of it is good to get. Um, and so I do think there's a genuine clean RNG component out there. I just don't think it's very hard. Then I think there's a another tier that probably um, echoes a bit the clean coal discussion. Uh, but there's some genuinely good RNG. Assemblywoman Cohen, I, I was curious whether the RNG argument would be a, a good sell in your state. Would that be something that you think the natural gas industry would get behind and if you were to tackle this issue again? I think so. Um, and I'm just looking at my, my notes from the scientists that I worked on on my bill. Um, and what what we had is that for us, it would all have to come from out of state and it would cost three to 18 times more than fossil fuel for us. Um, and then just some other information I have in my notes um, on renewable um, gas was um, that for the ecologically sound resources, it can only offset three to seven percent of total U.S. gas use and uh, still has the emissions issues. Got it. Let's see here. Um, okay. So I'm going to see one other question. Um, so one person asked, I'd be interested in the speaker's thoughts on rate basing versus tax funding aspects of this transition, especially since utility bills tend to be regressive and many states' tax systems are progressive. Anyone want to tackle that question? We, uh, I'll sure, just, go ahead. We actually have an extremely regressive um, state tax system. We don't have state income tax. Um, we're um, hopefully this session going to finally tax our minds um, because um, our constitution from the 1870s specifically excludes the minds. But um, so for us, that that wouldn't be an option. John? I, I just think you have to think about the federal tax system, which is progressive and which is um, the most meaningful system. And Chair Danner? I think we need to know what the, what the costs are really going to be, and then we can decide whether um, it's too much for ratepayers to pick up. Now, Washington is uh, just like Leslie's state, uh, um, but we also just got authority at our commission to have um, uh, low-income tariffs so we can get a little less regressive on the on the uh, uh, rate basing side. And uh, so we're going to be looking at everything. But we also need to just know, like, what can people afford? What are the, what, how high can it go before it's unaffordable? And then, then we can start looking for other sources of funding, whether it comes from the federal government, the state government, the shareholders, uh, or other sources. Great. Well, as a sort of final question, I'd like to go around and just have everyone weigh in on what you think your state's progress has been in sort of reaching these goals in for electrification and moving away from natural gas. Do you feel that you're in a good position right now? Do you see that there's a lot of work yet to be done? Just to recap for everyone. And we'll go, we can start with John and go in the order of the speakers. 
I think relatively New York has done a good job and uh, gotten, gotten a good start. Um, I think all states, including New York and the nation has a lot of work to do. I'm, I'm excited about where we are in Massachusetts. I think we've, we've, we're on a good start, but there is a lot to be done, much, much more to be done. I think we, we started the conversation. I, I think it's something that we're going to have to do a lot of work in the interim to bring um, community, or to bring the community around this and to counteract the work of the gas utility um, in, in making vulnerable communities, um, working communities um, and, and also labor communities against this, but I, I think it's work that can be done and that we're going to, you know, we, we, we set goals in the state and we're going to have to come up with some way to meet them. Chair Dana. You know, last year we had forest fires that were so bad that the air quality in our big cities was such that you couldn't see across the street and people were instructed to stay home. Um, and, uh, uh, it's getting worse. And I think the urgency of climate change is hitting us in a big way. And that is causing um, our policymakers and, and elected officials in our state to act uh, with much more urgency. And we've seen that our electricity sector, we've seen it in our transportation sector, and now we're starting to see it in the building sector. Yes, there's a lot to be done and it's very complicated. But I think that the instruction we have is, boy, we got to deal with this because if we don't, it's going to be bad. I think that's a great way to end. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation.